I am so glad to be here. It's nice to see you all. <laughs> Great, I'm glad you're here, yay. Um, I was just talking about our bingo card for 2022 and how we didn't know that we would uh, be experiencing a, a Russian invasion of Ukraine and how many of the themes in this book, The Living and the Lost, um, are so eerily topical. And it's uh, weird or unexpected, shall I say, to have front row seats to observe the visceral effects of war and the war crimes on everyday civilians. Um, Yet, here we are, and with remarkable timeliness, who knew, in a conversation about a book which deals with exactly those topics. So Ellen, you and I first crossed paths in person, well, sort of, it was on Zoom, <laughs> in the fall of 2020, when you joined my book club in Cedarhurst, New York, for uh, a discussion of Paris Never Leaves You. And so that book, in that book, you explore the impact of the choices people make to survive, with most of it taking place about 10 years after the war. Was there a connection between the two books? Um, there are several connections, actually. Um, the, the idea for this book, The Living and the Lost, actually came from an anecdote I read when I was researching Paris Never Leaves You. And it just gripped me, and I, I couldn't escape it. I, I kept thinking, well, it's, a, it's not my story. It's a painful story. Um, but it didn't apply to Paris Never Leaves You. And as I said, it, it just gripped me. So after I finished Paris Never Leaves You, I suddenly realized this is the book, I, this is the subject I wanted to deal with. Um, the other connection, I realized when I was looking at some notes for today that I'm pretty obsessed with survivor guilt. I hadn't been, you know, when you write a novel, it's amazing what you can learn about yourself. And um, I was very, uh, both books have a lot to do with survivor guilt. I mean, I think it's even more, uh, more noticeable, more powerful in the living and the loss than it was because uh, in the last book, Charlotte felt guilt for some things. In this book, it really is guilt for surviving when the rest of her family doesn't. I had a, I had a feeling there was a connection. Yeah. <laughs> a little bird, but. Um, were they both written like close together? Was there a, a break in between? And were they written during the pandemic? When were they written? They, um, it's, these books were written closer together than any books I've ever written. Because as I said, the second one grew out of the first. And Paris Never Leaves You was finished before the pandemic. I, can't, don't, I don't remember the update. I'm pretty sure, yeah, because I didn't have any in-person appearances for that either. So. Um, that was finished. And then, as I said, I just knew I had to write this book. And I was locked up, as we all were. And I just sat down and started writing, which is not to say it, it went smoothly that I wrote page one. And you know, eight months later, I wrote the end. Not by a long shot. I've never written a book like that in my life. And I think few people, maybe Charlotte and Dickens, but very few people write that way. Um, and it's, it's interesting about writers during the lockdown or the pandemic. I read, some write, I read, I don't know any, I've read writers who said they could not write a word during the lockdown. Uh, they were just too obsessed with the dangers and the grieving and all that. And I ran into a young man after we were beginning to go out, he's a nonfiction writer. He said it was the best time in his life. He got to spend time with his little girl and he got more work done than he had ever done, done in his life. So we all reacted differently, but I was locked up um, in a small house in Amagansett. Uh, but big enough for the two of us and a dog, and I just wrote it. It was, it was a very productive, and it was a horrible time for all of us, obviously, and you worried about people, but it was, I could escape um, into the book, which is, is very useful, obviously, for those for terrible times. Do you think you'll write something light next? <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Um, I, I don't think... The things that I write are so dark, but I guess they are. I guess I'm obsessed with dark matters. Um, and the book I'm working on now, I started thinking, this is this is frivolous. This is not serious enough. And then I realized there's something very painful in it. But it doesn't take on, um, in the same way, survivor or the war or how people came out. So, in fact, I started another book um, before the one I'm working on now. After I finished *The Living and the Lost*. And I said, I can't do one more. 
about somebody surviving the war and having to put a life back together. I said, it's just maybe eventually, maybe in a couple of books, I'll go back to it. But I just, I, it was just too much of a saying this. I, I thought, I, I, partly I thought I've written this before and partly I thought, um, I just, I didn't want to go back there again. I didn't want to go back to the war and the suffering. Interesting, yeah. I think uh, a lot of us are librarians in the room, and we can sort of attest that our numbers of circulated romances went up during the pandemic. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah, I mean, the book, the beginning of the, of the pandemic, the book, the nonfiction book that got me through was The Splendid and the Vile. Ah. Because I just kept thinking, you know, look at what, what life was like in England during the war and, and you know during the blitz and if people could live through that we could you know I, I felt safe in my house if I didn't go out and imagine you know you, you were afraid you're afraid to stay home you were afraid to go out you know you, you, there was no there was no sure safety um, you never knew which was worse my husband decided last night we should watch Chernobyl <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, it, it's, it's, you have to have the right thing at the right time, no question. <laughs> in any event, how was the publication journey for the Living in the Lost? It's your eighth novel. Um, was that um, some, what was the first thing that appeared? Was it a scene or a line of dialogue or a character? How did it come to you? How, how, the book how did the book come to you? As I, the incident I read about in rehearsing, in researching, um, Paris Never Leaves You is about a family and they're trying to escape occupied France. Uh, I guess, I guess, I'm not sure what, I guess into Spain. And um, there are teenage children and there are parents and they're stop, stopped by German Gestapo, German, German guards, whatever. And the guard said to the teenage boys, about 16, um, are you with, are you with those Jews up there, meaning their parents? And the young man thought so quickly on his feet and said, we're not with them. We never saw them before in our lives. And I thought, how do you, how do you, how do you do this? And then how do you live with that for the rest of your life? I mean, that's what one of the things that fascinates me about the war. That people, if you've gone through, how do you, how do you put your life back together? And it's amazing um, that many people do it successfully, and many people just can't do it. Um, and I think you never know which it's going to be for people. So I knew that I wanted to deal with this, and I had characters. Um, I had two discoveries during the research that were very, very helpful. I mean, because you start, well, you know, a nice idea, but you need the concrete aspects of it. Where do they live? Who are they? What's their family? All of this. And first I discovered a book called Sons and Soldiers, which is about the Ritchie boys and the German young men who came, came to this country before the war were first treated very, very badly because uh, they were seen as, and it, well, they were seen as, first of all, they were, they were mostly Jewish, and so there was a lot of anti-Semitism, and then they would thought, oh, they're German, they're spies, and then it became, um, when war, when Germany declared war on the U.S., they were suddenly enemy aliens, and then several months later, the State Department and the military realized they were sitting on a gold mine. These young men knew the language, knew the country, Knew the psychology, they were really tremendously useful. And our crypt, this is a funny story. Our um, intelligence and crypt, cryptology in this country before the war was in terrible shape because Secretary of War Stimson, I believe it was, who said, Gentlemen, don't read other gentlemen's mail. This was in the State Department <laughs> or the War Department. Anyway, so uh, they really geared up. And these young men were very eager. Uh, they were eager to serve America. They were eager to go back and defeat Hitler because it was a very personal argument, a very personal fight for them. Many of them went back hoping to find family members as the war, you know, as, as we progressed into Germany. Very few of them did, obviously. Um, but these young men were responsible for something like 60% of the actionable intelligence that was gathered for this. For, uh, the war in, in the Western, on the Western Front in the war, which is really quite amazing. Um, and the other discovery, I was reading a biography of a professor, Columbia professor, who was born in Germany, about his family coming here. And I came across the fact that 
his sister had won a scholarship to Bryn Mawr, which uh, they, they, you know this from the book, that they, uh, Bryn Mawr collected um, funds from students, administration, and professors uh, to set up two scholarships for non-Aryan German girls. <laughs> um, it took me a long time to figure out this phrase. Non-Aryan is a really strange phrase. I don't have any proof of this speculation, but the first, the president of Bryn Mawr, who was president at that time, was a racist and an anti-Semite. And I think it would, it would not have gotten past her if it, if it was for Jewish girls. She was M. Carrot Thomas. She was a big feminist, she was at terrific school, um, but she did not, I think that this was why they phrased it that way. Anyway, it was really, for me, that was very exciting because I'm an alum of Bryn Mawr. So uh, I, I kind of went back through my, I, I, there was there were some wonderful oral histories of Jewish students at Bryn Mawr in the 30s and early 40s, and I used those, but I also used my memories. And then something happens after you finish the book. You can't remember what really happened to you and what you, happened to your characters, because you, of course you embellish and change and that sort of thing. Um, but those were, and as that went on, I mean, I knew that uh, Millie and her brother David would have to get back to Germany. These gave me ways to get them back there. And that's what the, it, it builds. I mean, I used to teach creative writing. I don't believe you can teach creative writing. All you can do is edit what, what your students submit. And I always used to say, you have to start with some sort of an outline or a plan or you're writing in circles for the entire time. But if you have an outline and you finish the novel and it adheres strictly to your outline, you have a dead novel on your head. It just doesn't go anywhere. And I mean, the wonderful time occurrences are when a character gets up and, and takes on a life, a life of her own or his own and says, I won't leave the stage or I won't let you make me do that. It sounds silly, but it really is. You're writing and you know this character wouldn't do that. And it resists you and you're deleting and deleting and then you say, oh, that's why. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that sort of segues into my question, another question I have, which is something I've been hearing other people ask authors, are you a plotter or a pantser? And I didn't even know what that term was, but I know you know. But it's whether you plot the book or you have the outline all set out before you start writing or you go by the seat of your pants. That's where the pantser part comes in. But then you might also be a planter, which is something between a plotter and a panther. A pantser, so. I think I'm more of a pantser, but I, I obviously plot too. I had a really, a minor epiphany Friday night about this. Um, I went to the Met, the Winslow Homer show, which is fabulous. And I, we're all accustomed when we look at paintings to see their territory sketches and territory oils in some part. And there's one painting that Winslow Homer worked on for close to 40 years, I think. And and you look at the changes, there's another one where, you know, we all see this. They paint out figures they have in the first place. And I said, oh my heavens, that's that's what I'm doing in a different, which I'm not, I'm not comparing myself to Winslow Homer. Please <laughs> let me say that quickly. But um, I I sometimes, when I throw out a scene or a character just won't get up and take on any life, I think, What's wrong with me? And then I say, no, I'm doing, I said Friday night, I'm doing what those painters do. You're repainting, you're making changes, you're painting characters out or overpainting them. And so in that sense, I think I'm more of a pantser, but I'm always going back and forth, back and forth. I love that. I think you are like Winslow Homer. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you want to tell us a little bit about your writing career and how you got to this point? I mean, you have eight novels and um, did, did it take you uh, a long time to get them, or, or did they um, like were they one year every year for eight no, years? Oh, no. I actually, um, well, I'm, I have other books that I wrote that are, are different. So I, I think we mentioned Linalia. I don't want to talk about them now. But I started out uh, in a publishing job. I started out writing copy. Um, publishers pre electronic days used to issue two or three catalogs a year that announced coming list and I was hired to write copy about the books. Um, my downfall was that I wrote, I, I liked writing the copy and did. And then the, the man who owned the publishing house said, oh well when they when I forget why the publicity director left, but you can be the publicity director because you write good copy. Well the last thing about being a publicity director, the last thing that's important is writing copy. I mean I wrote press releases that were fine. I knew nothing about publicity. 
I knew nothing about this the era when television was becoming very important to sell books. So it was not only how good the book was, it was is the author attractive on television? Is the author lively? That kind of thing. And I was really bad. But two things happened. One day I was sitting in the editor in chief editor in chief's office. And I, a man I really respected, Lord, and he looked at me. We were talking about a schedule today. He looked at me and said, "Why don't you quit and go home and write a book?" <laughs> I hope he was saying that he liked my writing and not that I was such a a mess as a publicity director. <laughs> well, I couldn't. I couldn't just throw in my job and home and start writing. But a few months later, I got fired at the Christmas party uh -huh. by the man who owned the um, the publishing house. Uh, I, I wrote. This is on my website. I wrote an article for Literary Hub about this. I. It was the, also the days of, of publicity parties or publication day parties, and part of your job as a publicist is throwing the party. And it's therefore and making sure that the writer and any celebrities you can get, you know, you can get, get come to the party are happy. So I was doing my job, and there was a very famous and well regarded writer there who was not the author, and he was also a terrific womanizer. And um, he was coming on politely to this party. And I didn't want to offend him. He's, you know, America's important writer, but I also wasn't interested. And it, uh, this will tell you how long ago it was by the praising. Um, I said, it's okay that you're a male chauvinist pig because you're a charming male chauvinist pig. <laughs> well, he knew what I was saying and he was flattered. The owner of the man who owned the company, the publisher's secretary was walking by as she heard this. And the next morning she went into the man who owned the company and said, last night, I heard our publicist calling so and so a male chauvinist pig. <laughs> Needless to say, my but it was fine. I, I mean, I, I liked getting fired. I, I wouldn't have gotten myself out of there anyway. <laughs> Christmas party was a little extreme, but <laughs> wow, that is some story. Um, I just want to ask you a little bit about your Long Island connection, since that's what brought us together. I mean, you're in Amagansett, which yeah. is a part of East Hampton, yeah. and how long have you been there? Um, I think about 35 years. We, we started out, uh, my husband and I, we live in Manhattan, and we started renting very small cottages. We, some are called the cottage, some are called the shack on the North Fork. And I'm not sure why we came to the South Fork. It must be my husband's choice. He's very, he's a big fisherman and a big uh, bird watcher. So we ended up on the South Fork, and um, we rented 10 cottages and shacks, and then we found our little cottage, which I love. And it's pretty much in well, it, it, there are houses around over across from the nature preserve, and so it's it's really, I mean, it, it's really an unwinding place for us on weekends and during the summer, and it was wonderful during the lockdown. It was so much easier than Manhattan, um, which sounds awful. I mean, I would we we spent much of it in Manhattan. And I would we're very close to Mount Sinai Hospital. And every morning, well, you heard the sirens all the time. Every morning, I'd see people going to work, and I know it's a cliche, but I was always thanking them, thanking them all of this. Um, but I'm and, Oh, and the other thing is, we're very our house is very close to the Jackson Pollock House, and you know when you're out there why the painters all went out there to the East End after the war. The light lights it like Provence. It's gorgeous, and some nights I just sit there and think. Oh, I'm so lucky to be here. It's so beautiful. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, so I just want to just reference a bit about the book cover. So um, you talk about the emotional cost of survival. And I just wondered, are you happy with the cover? Because it kind of uh, gives us a sense of that. Um, I'm not happy, but I, th I think it's a very handsome cover. I think the art department did a great job. Is it a little romantic for my taste? Yes. Um, the other, the, the other matter is I have different covers in every country. Um, the for this one, uh, no, this one Australia. The last one Australia and the UK were similar. This one they're very different. Years ago, I published a book called Scottsboro, and uh, the UK jacket. I mean, this is this is a horrible story in America's past about injustice and nine young black men who were almost hanged or electrocuted because of this, and they were saved. But it was really a painful story. 
and the UK bought the rights and they sent me the jacket art. And it looked, it was a nice young man, nice black young man in a tweed jacket, looking as if he wants, he's got about to write a poem. And I immediately called my editor there and I said, this is not what this book is about. She said, and, and I've learned to listen to these people, we know our market, you know, and apparently, I'm as hard to believe, the UK market is very different from the American market, the Australian market apparently is closer to um, America than to the UK, and it's, it's really a marketing decision. I mean, I years ago, uh, an editor said to me, you can put up a fight about a change title or artwork on the, the cover. And then the sales department will come back to you in a year and say, we told you it wouldn't sell. So I have to trust them. I don't know anything about marketing. I, I hope I know about writing the book. And uh, I just, and then it gets, it almost, like with the, this, this one is still fairly new, so I don't have too many foreign covers. Paris never leaves you. I love seeing the different covers. There's one from South America, I think Bolivia, that is a hopper painting. And I said, how could they afford this? stolen but I you know, <laughs> nobody tells me anything I don't speak Spanish so it's, it's just a beautiful cover with a hopper painting wow yeah I'd like to see that I mean I, I like the uh, Australian cover I think of this book is yes, really good I do too. so yeah. I'm, we have that on the crowdcast for those uh, people who are watching on crowdcast are able to see the covers before we started speaking so um, I want to ask also about the title so was this the title always no <laughs> The title, um, wait, oh, I'm sorry, no, this was not the title for Paris Never Leaves You, um, was not the original title. It was a bookshop on the route of something, and uh, they changed it to Paris Never Leaves You, and I said, okay. And, um, and then, strangely enough, UK and Australia went back to closer to the original title. Um, I'm trying to remember now what this title was. It, it might have been leaving Berlin, which it is in yeah, in, in uh, the UK and Australia. Um, but I didn't, and a, a publisher in my publishing house, the publisher, uh, they call her the title whisperer. They think that she really knows how to do it. And I'm not, I mean, she publishes many, many books a year. I'm certainly not gonna go to the mat with her about this sort of thing. It, I, I, will, I will fight about things if they try to change some things within the book. Then I would put up a fight. I mean, not everything. I don't. I'm not a prima donna. I can be edited. I need editing. Um, but if it, if it's really, I think you know, the wrong change or a cheap change, I'll fight it. Um, but here, as I said, this marketing. I I am not an expert in marketing. Well, I, I you know, when you think about the cover, you realize it has to be Millie and Theo embracing because Millie did not embrace Harry at the train station. Oh yes. At the end, I thought it was just a right. kiss. Yeah. kiss you're us. right. You're, he, he, he pulls back. I've been spending too much time with this book. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just a kiss because he's all, you know, he's no, having his no, moment. Right. So, but it's it's actually my editor um, had said to me about another book. Said, we don't want maybe it's different editor, but it doesn't matter. Oh, we don't want it to be too particular because they don't want the reader to look at the artwork and say, oh, that's what Millie looks like. That's what David looks like, that kind of thing. And, and that's why, actually, when they said The Living and the Lost, I liked the title because I think it's evocative. Um, and it reminds me of uh, Male and the Naked and the Dead, even better, uh, Fitzgerald, the beautiful. And it's not the beautiful and the damned, it's the beautiful and damned. He used to get furious when people put the second article in because he said they're the same people, beautiful and damned. So, Interesting. Yeah. Oh, I didn't make the connection between the naked and the dead. But the living and the loss is very evocative, and that, that was really where I was going with this. Um, so I just, um, if we could talk, I, we're getting, we're going to start taking questions in, in a few minutes, but um, the living, the actually, the theme of PTSD I wanted to talk about. Uh, most of the characters, the major and most of the minor characters, are suffering from some type of PTSD. And you do a brilliant job of Careful, carefully differentiating the types of trauma that people are dealing with and how long it takes them or if they can ever fully recover, and many don't. Um, but 
Did you have like a sensitivity reader about that? Did you have any input from a mental health professional who was reading it to see if the treat, you know, the, the way they acted was um, made sense in terms of their cases that they've dealt with? Full disclosure. I'm married to a psychiatrist, <laughs> <laughs> and I will occasionally ask him for you know, I'll say you know, a specific question, and he does. He's my first reader. He reads everything, and he will sometimes say, you know, psychologically, I don't buy this or something like that. Um, but I found something very, very interesting between us early on. He's been trained. I mean, he's a, he's a medical doctor and a psychiatrist. He's been trained to look at my neurosis and put me in a category. I've been trained, or I trained myself as a writer, to look at the category and find the individual in it. And this makes for, for really interesting give and take between us about this kind of thing. Um, so, but, but yes, I did ask him a lot of questions. No, it's very authentic, and, and I, it really worked, I thought, and uh, you did a great job on that. Um, so at its core, this is a book about family and home and identity. What does home mean when you're in exile? Is Millie now more an American or a German? What What's the moment that she became an American? Um, to Millie, as the book opens, David is both her only remaining family and her home. Uh, she worries that if she doesn't come to grips with her inner turmoil, she might push him away and end up family less and alone. And she desperately wants to keep a strong connection with him. So can you tell us about um, the brother-sister relationship that you, you developed with them? Is that based on your own sibling relationships? Because it's so beautiful. It's very beautiful. Oh, no, I have no brothers. I have sisters. I have no brothers. Um, but it is. It's a family relationship. And very early on, um, the scene where he comes home, she's waiting for him to come home, and she's going crazy. Where is him? And he's not. Where is he? He's not safe. Um, I wrote that was written very differently in the first version of it. That when he comes home, she goes running out to him. So, and, and it came clear to me very early on, and this is from my family experience that if she is too clingy to him, she's going to end up. She said, "A lonely old woman." And you know, it's the go kiss not really, but they won't really want to, that kind of thing. So she has to hold on to him. Many years ago, an editor, early in my career, an editor said to me, he said, struggling with the scene, we were, I was in his office, he said, write it backwards. And I said, What do you mean write it backwards? Because I mean you can do that chronologically, 